Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the No Laying Up Podcast. Sala here, got an interview coming shortly with our guy Daniel Berger, maybe the forgotten man in men's professional golf. Uh, DB Straight Vibin is back playing competitively. He's been away for a long time. In case you don't know about his injury history, what he's been up to, we talk about all of that. Uh, and it's it's been kind of fun to just reflect on, on what he was doing but prior to being injured. I don't know if uh, I could have named off the top of my head that Daniel Berger was a top 20 player in the world before he got hurt. And uh, I do feel like people have forgotten about him, and I think he's uh, he's ready to come back and play a little bit of golf. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Roback Activewear. You all know Roback, best fit, best feel. We cannot go anywhere without seeing that subtle dog logo. I don't need to tell you what I've got on. You know I've got a Roback hoodie on. My daughter absolutely loves these things. Had to throw one on at 5 in the morning this morning when she started crying. Go into her room, pick her up. She puts her head on the Roback, uh, the Roback Performance hoodie. She goes right back to sleep every time. She absolutely loves these things. Uh, they are fresh off a restock of some of our favorite performance polos. The material is moisture wicking. It's got great stretch. The collar is crisp. It does not lose its shape. It just fits so much better than those old boxy polos. The hoodies, just some of the most fantastic uh, clothes I have in my entire closet. It makes up most of my closet now at this point. Um, and despite that, I still struggle to keep a proper amount in rotation. The Performance Q-Zips are back. We love them. They're great for a classic look. Uh, the Performance Patrick is soft, makes them very comfortable. They work on and off the golf course. And if you haven't already, time to load up on some Roback, both for yourself and for others. Code NLU at Roback.com for generous 20% off your first order through the end of this week. That's R-H-O-B-A-C-K.com. 20% off bottoms, Q-Zips, hoodies, and more with code NLU. Get ready for the golf season with Roback. Without any further delay, here is Daniel Berger. All right, you've had a lot of time off, but from what I'm hearing, I'm, I'm afraid to ask this next question because I don't think it's the answer I'm going to be looking for. But how much time has, have you spent on the boat in the last year and a half? Yeah, it's a funny. Uh, I felt like a lot of people were asking that question. I have not done any boating for a while because it wasn't, uh, it just wasn't that comfortable to go on the boat for, for the body, you know, bouncing up and down. So, was one of the few things that really gave me joy in life that was taken away from me. But now I'm good. So now I'm now I'm able to do what I love to do. I'm glad I didn't know this the whole time you were hurt because I, I just kept picturing. I'm like, dude, he's probably doing fine. He's probably out on the boat like every day. He's probably not hating this at all. But man, take golf and boating away from you. What were you doing with all your time off? <sighs> a lot of rehab, a lot of sitting around. I thought to myself, like, what am I going to do? I can't play golf. What am I going to do? I was like, maybe... I'll like learn a second language. So I like downloaded the Babbel app and like spent like f five minutes on it. I was like, this is not for me either. So <laughs> like I did not do a lot. I'm not going to lie. Well, so what did you do though? I mean, you play video games. I mean, I, I, cause I listened to an a podcast you did where you had, a, you were coming off a recent injury, but this was several years ago. And you were talking about how, like you thought you didn't love golf that much. And then that, that time off really showed you that you do love it. Now, this was a much more extended time off from, from any other previous injury you've had. Yeah. What I did was I had this like anti-gravity chair that I put in front of my TV and I just watched cooking channel shows and, literally i mean it was like it was brutal like you know how to, it's hard to pass like 15 hours a day doing nothing so um i wouldn't uh, wouldn't wish it upon anybody so what for the, the the boring part getting this out of the way for those that aren't familiar you uh you know you recently returned to the pga tour you your last start prior to that was the us open in 2022 you took a lot of time off with a back injury can you kind of detail uh, you know kind of what happened with your back and uh what what you've been kind of going through over the last year and a half to get ready to get back out on the golf course yeah, basically what happened is I played the Ryder Cup and uh, I took three months off after the Ryder Cup because I was just kind of tired of golf. I was like exhausted from the grind and I had a long year and a half before that and basically probably did the least amount in the gym, the least amount of golf, the least amount of walking, kind of just like totally stopped golfing for like three months. And then I came back, I think it was uh, Hawaii just my body felt weird. It didn't feel like normal. Like I, I had some tightness in my back, but I was fine. Like it didn't hurt me or anything. And then I got to San Diego a couple weeks later and I remember like hitting balls on the range and I was like, oh my God, like I can't even like swing the club. Just kind of the athlete in me was like, you know, we're just going to keep playing. We're not going to stop. I finished that tournament and like I couldn't bend over. I couldn't sit down and I was never had any back pain ever in my life. That was the point where I was like, oh shit, this is a problem. You know, like this is not normal. This is not your everyday tightness. This is like something more serious than that. And I uh, took a couple weeks off. It got a little bit better, but it wasn't really making that full recovery that I was hoping for. And I was, 
going to tournaments doing like a quarter of the practice and a quarter of the preparation that I was used to doing. And I was still competing. Like I, you know, I almost won the Honda and, you know, I had some good finishes here and there, but I was like, this is just not, this is not healthy from like an everyday lifestyle. Like I can't do the things that I want to do. And I, and I don't feel good when I get up in the morning. So that was kind of the point around that us open time where I was just like, this is, this is not going to work for me. So took some time away, kind of struggled to get a diagnosis at first. I think uh, now that I've gone through it, you know, the back is a complicated thing. It's not, sometimes it can be cut and dry, but sometimes it's not necessarily. And so I uh, kind of bounced around some different opinions early on. And then finally went to see this guy, uh, Dr. McGill in Canada. Um, and he really gave me a solid diagnosis, really gave me a plan kind of uh, changed the team that I had around me, got a new um, strength and condition coach that uh, really put me on a specific program to really get back to golf. And we kind of just micro progressed out of it. And it started with just like three basic exercises every single day. And from there we built on it and eventually uh, got back to, you know, fully lifting again and doing, you know, the stuff that I used to do beforehand. And you know, there's just some stuff I stay away from. There's some things I don't do, but overall, I'm you know 100 percent now. I feel perfect. That's good. Would because uh, in reading about it, it, doesn't seem like you know somebody's out for a while. They go get a procedure, and it's like, hey, I'm going to be out six to eight months. I'm going to be out this period. I'm going to be out this. But it seemed like there was a ton of trial and error in there, right? You're summarizing that kind of briefly as to what what that's been yeah. like. But you didn't know that when you were going to be coming back, or because you opted not for any surgery uh, surgery routes. Like, how did you? What was that whole process like? Of uh, this is what's. I mean, this is what I appreciate about what you guys do is. Baseball teams like they have trainers that you know are looking out for, uh, for you. But like as a as a golfer, you're in charge of your own decisions on this front. So I found that kind of decision you had to make pretty fascinating. Yeah, I think I mean you hear a lot of the stories of guys coming back too early and uh, and getting hurt again or or not feeling like they were able to do what they want to do to prepare. And that was kind of my goal. I was like, listen, I'm not going to come back and play golf till I can go out there and prepare to 100 percent and do everything that I need to do. And if I need to hit 300 balls, I can hit 300 balls. And if I, I need to walk 36 holes in a day, I can walk 36 holes in a day. And, and that just was a period of time that it took to get to that stage where I felt like I was good to go. And yeah, I mean, you like, you look at some of these other guys, you know, I don't know exactly what they've gone through, but they have surgery or multiple surgeries. And then like four months later, they're playing golf. And I'm just like, wow, that's, that's impressive because I didn't, I didn't even have surgery and it took me, you know, 15 months to get back to where I felt, you know, good enough to play, but I guess everything is kind of uh case to case. And yeah, it's just, uh, you have to listen to your body and you have to, you know, trust it. I think pain is there for a reason. It's telling you something. And I think the, uh, the athlete in me just says power through, go ahead. Don't, you know, you know, it's, going to be okay. But then you get to a point where you kind of cross the threshold of okay. And you're like, Oh shit, something's wrong. And so that was, that was tough for me because uh, like I said, unless I'm, unless I'm to the point where like I physically cannot move, I just find a way to compensate and just get the ball in the hole. And that's what I did for a little while. And so got to the point where I was just like, this is not doable anymore. And, and that's where I decided to really step away and get back to feeling a hundred percent. Everyone, I mean, it feels like everyone at some point deals with back issues, right? Especially golfers. But I mean, it, it, it just affects your everyday life. That's the part that, you know, is, is just puts, I got back stuff going on and I've had it for several months now and it just puts me in a bad mood. Like you can't move around yeah. the same and it just like, yeah. it's just debilitating, man. And it just, it's like, seems like the hardest thing to cure. I'm, uh, I, I'm not comparing what I've, what I'm going through with what you've gone through, but man, it just, just kind of deflates you. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. I think back pain like after going through this i've got a lot of perspective on it i think like everyone has some point in their life where their back bothers them and uh, it's like it's more common than the than the flu you know like everyone has some period where they're dealing with something but uh yeah it's really just about like managing it right and like doing the things uh that you need to do in order to be able to play and like the level of professionalism i would say that i bring to my game now is is tenfold to what it was before because you know you don't want to go down that route that you experienced before and so you have to really stay on top of things but I'm not a guy that's uh that's ever going to complain about having to do more you know like I'm so lucky to be able to play this game for a living and if you told me 
I had to do 10 times what I'm doing right now, I would still do it. So it's, it's honestly easy to, to just go ahead and, and, you know, be the best version of yourself as cliche as that sounds. <laughs> well, what's a, what's a morning tea time look like for you now compared to uh compared to, to pre back injury? Well, when I was like 22 years old, I could get up an hour before my tea time and swing at 120 miles an hour and go right to the tea. But now it's, it's a little more like a three hour wake up call before, before a tea time. So I'm off, if I'm off at eight, I'm, I'm up at five to warm up. But I used to joke about it because, you know, like I play a lot of golf with Patrick Cantley around, you know, around town. And, you know, he had some back stuff early on in his career. And I'd ask him, I said, what time do you want to play? You want to play at eight, eight 30. And he would always like shake his head, like, absolutely not. I never really understood why, but now I get it. It's because he's doing the same stuff that I'm doing now. So you just learn what you need to do and and you just do it. It's kind of like, you know, you brush your teeth, you eat breakfast, you do your exercises, you know, it's kind of just the programming within you. It just changes to where it's just a part of your routine. Well, back to the important stuff now the, on, on the boating front, because I don't think we've covered all that, right? You, again, old interviews I've listened to you, like that's a passion of yours is being out of the mm-hmm. water. Like that's your thing. So you weren't able to do a lot of that. It wasn't comfortable. Are you now able to do that? And is that still something that uh, you enjoy passing your time with? And we, we need an update on the on the whole straight vibe and fleet. I, I got to know what you've got over there. And uh, <laughs> I, I've heard rumors, but I, 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 need, I need the full story. Yeah, listen, boating is definitely like the number one hobby outside of golf. It's pretty much like the, if I had to, to choose one thing to do if I wasn't playing golf and be on the boat, whether it's going to the Bahamas or even just going for a cruise, you know, on the intercoastal, but um, it didn't feel right to do it. And uh, it was bothering me, but now I feel hundred percent. Like I have no problem. I could go run 200 miles across the Atlantic ocean and feel completely fine and go fish for 12 hours and have no issues. But I just think that like where I'm at after taking a year and a half off, it's probably not responsible to take, two weeks off to go fishing. Like I need to need to buckle down and, uh, and, and start, uh, racking up some FedEx cup points and, you know, get that world ranking from whatever the heck it is right now to pre pre all of this shit. Well, uh, you know, there's the golf world went through some pretty drastic changes, uh, during, during your time off. And, and, you know, you were, you were having so much success as you, as you said, kind of before all this happened, like, does, is there any feeling of like getting bypassed while you're sitting out? Right. I mean, there's new names that are popping up now on leaderboards. There's, uh, you know, uh, the, the events have all changed now on the PGA tour. What's kind of, what's like getting, what's it like getting back into the competitive flow, uh, with that much time off? I think the, the most interesting thing is like showing up to the, to the tournament and not knowing like 75% of the people that are out there just because I'm not a guy that like casually watches golf. So I haven't really paid attention to like who's come up from the corn Ferry and who's, you know, recently won. And, um, yeah, I just like, I, I look down the range and I'm like, man, like where did all the guys that I played with go? But I'm sure that's kind of how, you know, some of the older guys, not that I'm old, but some of the guys that when I first came out on tour felt, you know, when I was coming out there, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it, I don't think uh, it's a bad thing. I think it's always nice to have a little bit of a changeover. And uh, but the whole, you know, saga of the live, you know, BS and not BS, but the whole golf world right now. I'm kind of glad that I didn't have to uh, experience all of that stuff and and deal with it because it's just like it's like a drain on yourself if you really like think about all the stuff that's going on and it's just. I try to focus on what I can control and like none of that stuff is in my control, which kind of sucks, but yeah, it's been, it's been a crazy like two years with all that going on. Well, it's, a, it, you know, it can be a helpful thing too. And, and, you know, you've got enough on your plate as it is. Have you, are, have you ventured into like all the stuff that's going on with SSG and equity and all this stuff and signature events and all the changes that have happened? Are you, are you just like, dude, just tell me when and where my tea time is and I'm going to go play. How oh. involved, how involved are you and how involved do you want to be and all that? Oh. Well, I'd like to be more involved, but, uh, you know, before this all happened, you know, I was the top 20 player in the world and I was in every major championship and all the, I would be in all the elevated events. And, you know, obviously that's all changed, you know, nothing was protected. So, you know, when I came back, I basically came back with full PJ tour status, but not qualified for any of those events. And so, you know, like the last time I played Pebble beach, I won the golf tournament and I never got a chance to defend it because, you know, I got hurt the next year and then it became an elevated event and, I, and you needed to, I wasn't into it. So, um, and I didn't get a sponsor's invite, which it's not the end of the world, but it would have been nice to, you know, be able to, uh, 
to defend the tournament that I won the last time I played it. But yeah, the whole thing is, it's like exhausting to think about. Like I, it's, I don't even know what to say. Like I sat there and I listened to, uh, you know, like in one of those player meetings most recently at, at the TPC Scottsdale event, I was like, this is just like so much going on in the golf world. I was like, I don't even, it's like mentally exhausting to think about. I don't really know how else to put it, but I feel bad for whoever has to like deal with that on the day to day. I really respect the guys that are on the player board because they're trying to balance, you know, our best interests while playing, you know, golf for themselves and their families. So it's a, it's a big undertaking. That's for sure. What is, what was it like being back in competition? What, you know, did the, the feels, were they familiar? Did it feel totally different? And we can talk a little bit about kind of some of the changes you made to your, to your golf swing and to your kind of team as well. Uh, you, you know, you mentioned that earlier, but getting back into the swing of things, you, I believe you'd only played about 10 rounds in the previous six months before you teed it up at the Amex, but you, you've, you've had some success when you do tee it up. What's it, what's it like getting back in the competition? Yeah, it was kind of just like, it didn't feel that crazy or that different you know it was more excitement like you know i remember the first day that the first round of the amex i woke up at like 4 30 in the morning and i was just like ready to run through a brick wall i was so pumped but uh yeah i mean like i love those those kind of like uh i wouldn't call them nervous jitters but like excitement ready to go feeling like excited about what you're having in store for you um it was nice to get off to what I would call a decent start after 18 months off and make the cut and play four rounds. And then two weeks after that and uh, at waste management, which is obviously, you know, a big event. I haven't played in front of a ton of people in a while and there was a couple hundred thousand people there. So it was just, I feel like getting my feet under me and, and getting in that atmosphere and, and, you know, making some birdies and feeling the crowd, that was kind of a nice thing. And now I feel already like I'm back into, you know, like I've played golf for the last year so it really only felt like it only took me a couple events to really get back under my feet and feel like I was ready to go. If I have it right, you're working with Mark Blackburn now and and you've made some changes to your golf swing, I guess. It, t tell me, is it to, to help suit your back and kind of the changes, you know, or the, the injury that you've gone through? Is this a more sustainable swing, I guess, for your back and kind of take us through that process? Yeah. You know, I think I looked at every aspect. I mean, I had a lot of time off. That was the one thing I did is I kind of looked at every aspect of my game and and what I could improve on and, areas that I thought I needed to uh, get better at. And, you know, the golf swing was definitely a factor in, in what was going on from the back and with my back. I think I have a, a little bit of a unique move, but um, we looked at some of the 3d data, um, sent it out to a couple different people. And uh, we found some pretty simple things in my swing that were, you know, a contributing factor to what I was dealing with. And so um, kind of, went down the list of a couple of people that I thought, you know, could be helpful and, and landed on, uh, and landed on Blackburn, um, and went to go see him in Birmingham. And really the first thing that we kind of dove into is how to, how to swing the club and be pain free, you know, cause that's, that's the goal, right? You can't play golf if you're hurting. And so, um, we, uh, we found a little thing to work on and that's kind of been what I've been uh, dealing with in the last couple of months. And, you know, I never really have made a swing change in like 15 years of playing golf. It's your, your swing is always evolving, but this was like a really targeted change. So it was unique to go through that experience, but it really doesn't feel, you know, different in a sense of where like I get over a shot and I'm like, Whoa, what is this feeling? Or where's the ball going to go? It, it's, I feel like I'm athletic and I can just make the, make it happen with a simple thought and that's that's what i did this is a good time to update you on the no laying up email newsletter if you aren't a subscriber you should be you can sign up at newsletter.nolayingup.com we send out the email newsletter twice a month uh in this friday's edition you'll find an update on our 2024 event series a fun q a with the whole squad about guided by our guy kbv updates on upcoming content from no laying up the email newsletter is the best way to stay up to date on all things nlu and get exclusive subscriber specials in the pro shop again you can subscribe for free newsletter.nolayingup.com get involved that's from the merch star back to daniel berger this is probably a dumb question but do you ever i don't know how else to ask this but do you ever like sit and think about how many people play golf like around the world and do you ever like you, you mentioned this, you were a top 20 player in the world do you ever think about like man there aren't 20 guys in the world better than me at this sport like do you ever sit and think about that in terms of what you've accomplished in golf yeah i think i always thought i was a little bit of an underachiever or excuse me I always thought that like when I looked at like 
my career as a whole, because I had, like I said, I had a lot of time to sit around and, you know, you, you think about a lot of things in your time off, but I would never give myself that much credit. Like, you know, I've won, you know, some, I've won some golf tournaments and I played in a Ryder cup and I played in a president's cup and I've, you know, contended in major championships and it never really like felt successful in a way. And, uh, and I think when I had the time off, I kind of sat around and I was like, you know what? I'm pretty, pretty fucking good at the game of golf. And, uh, it gave me some, some good confidence that like, you know, I've accomplished a lot and that, you know, like if golf were to end today, I would still be thankful for the time that I had, but, um, you know, I don't have a lot of quit in me. So I, even if this thing, if, if this process took three years to get back, you know, I still, I'd be going through the only thought in my mind every single day that I woke up is how do I get one step closer to being back at a golf tournament? And I think with that mindset, it's, you're not going to fail because there is no, there's no room for failure. You just put one foot in front of the other until eventually you get there. But um, I hope at one time in my career that there's only one guy ahead of me and, or zero guys ahead of me and I'm the guy. So, and I truly believe that, you know, I don't know if that'll ever happen, but I, I believe I can get there. So that's, you know, people will probably laugh at that, whatever. I don't really care. It's oh, the way God. I feel about my game. No, I mean, you've gotten like, crazy close to that. That's the thing that I'm kind of getting at is yeah. the longer I do this, the more I realize how many pro golfers there are. I mean, the, the volume yeah. is insane. And to, to, you know, this is, this is funny. You know what I always think about? I always think about how many bad golfers there are like terrible, terrible golfers. Like I watch people and I'm like, if I played golf like that, I would quit. I would never hit a golf ball. Like, if that's the way I play golf, this would just not be enjoyable. Well, it's it's fun. I, I'm wondering if you if you felt this at all either, because nothing to me looks harder like when I'm going through back stuff and I'm out for a while than golf. Like I, if I drive by a golf hole, I'm like I can't even like picture hitting a golf shot on this. I'm wondering <laughs> if like did it ever feel insurmountable in terms of like not only do I have to get all the way back to health, but I have also got to like now go out and beat all these dudes who are you have a year of practice on me now that I've uh, that I've had to put the clubs away for a while. I think the hardest part is looking at the amount of time it's going to take to get to where you know you want to be. Right. So like I could sit there and plan out six months in advance what I was going to need to do. And when you look at something six months out in advance, you're like, wow, that is so much work and that is going to take so long and there's going to be so many long days. But then when you kind of just break it down into like a one day out of a time mentality, it becomes more feasible and it becomes doable. And then next thing you know, you know, six months has gone by and you're where you want to be. And so that was kind of the biggest process for me is not looking at, you know, the long term and really focusing on the short term. And eventually you just start stacking these good days upon each other and you just start getting better and better and better. And you're like, wow, I'm where I wanted to be. But, you know, I planned it six months ago. I heard you say in an interview before too, that you've, uh, you, you've always written stuff down, whether that be, uh, you know, kind of take us there. Is that lessons you've learned from other people? Is that stuff you've kind of taught yourself or things you just want to remember? Do you still write a, a lot down? Do you look back on notes and stuff? I'm wondering what that, uh, what that looks like. Yeah. I mean, I've, I think I've always written stuff down since I was young. I mean, I, I've been a, a journal from like 2007 or 2008 from like some of my first golf lessons, you know, and it's just funny to like read the stuff that I was writing and like, I'm like, wow, that's, that's what I was working on back then. But no, I think it's a good way to, uh, to give yourself perspective and to, again, really stack good days upon each other. Because when you don't write it down, you almost can get caught in this like negative outlook of where you don't realize all the good stuff that have happened in a day or all the things that you can be grateful for. And, and when you write them down, I feel like it really sticks with you and you can go back and look at it. And um, that was something that was really important to me. And I would keep a journal of like how many golf balls I hit and how many chips I hit you know, more recently in the last like year and a half, because I was kind of tracking, you know, my, not my performance, but I was tracking kind of on a ball count. And so like, I look back at it and I'd be like a year and a half ago, I hit 20, 20 chip shots and 10 putts. And now I'm up to hitting, you know, as many golf balls as I want, but that wasn't that long ago that I could only hit 20 chip shots and, and feel like, okay. So I've come a long way since, since that short time ago. 
little better than what I do. I, I, uh, if I find a swing field, I'll take out my notes app and just write the swing field down and, and think that that'll address my, all of my golf problems forever. I like your process. It'll, it'll, prob- it'll probably help though. That's for it'll sure. help for like three days and then I forget mm-hmm. about it and then try a whole new field. It's, uh, it's what the us mortals have to have to go through. But do you, so you mentioned you don't watch a lot of golf. Like do you, do you watch any golf? Like do you still not have the PGA tour app on your phone? I believe I've heard that from you in the past. I just downloaded the PGA Tour app because because uh, I need to see sometimes like where I'm at or like you know I want to see what the cut is or whatever. But no, I, honestly, I, I I actually think golf is is entertaining to watch. But I uh, I don't know. It's like when you're not playing the game and you, and you feel like you can't play to then like watch guys do what what you want to do is like so painful that it's like not even worth watching. So I really stayed away from it. I watched a lot of tennis. I like watching tennis. Um, but other than that, it's just been, you know, any other sport other than golf. Is the Ryder Cup any different? Did you watch any of that? I mean, having been on the twenty twenty, I did team. watch the right. I did watch the Ryder Cup. That was the one thing I watched. I actually thought it was it was really fun to watch. You know, more fun to be there in person, but you know, exciting to to see the guys competing out there and representing their country. It was it was cool. I wish they, you know, would have uh, got a few more victories there on some of those matches, but you know it's just it's a good it's a great tournament to watch what happened and, you know if you're if you're a fan like me i was expecting the u.s to win you win in record fashion when you play at whistling straits and you go over and throw up a, a four zero stinker in the opening session i know you haven't played on one of these away yet but as a you, mm-hmm. as a golfer how does that happen how, how, how does uh you know can a home field advantage really play that much of an effect because that that's what it felt like from watching it the home field advantage is definitely a factor you know I don't know if you know the the fan at home knows, but the the home team controls the golf course, right? So they control the speed of the greens, the length of the rough, all of those you know small little factors. But you know they're looking at all the stats and they're going, all right, well our guys hit it three twenty five off the tee, we're going to set the course up really long. Our guys putt better on really fast greens, we're going to make the greens really fast. So you know it's always to their advantage to set it up the way that their players are going to play the best, but you know, obviously it just comes down to who plays better golf. And I think they played better golf and they had the home crowd advantage and, you know, they made more putts. And when you make more putts in a Ryder cup, you're going to, you're going to play better. That's, that's the one piece of information I feel like over the last two team events that I've played in, that's what, that's what it looks like. The team that putts better plays better and they seem to make more putts. What's your your lasting memory from uh, from Whistling Straits? I, I'm guessing for a lot of people, the first thing that comes to mind is the uh, the beer chug on the first tee. But I'm wondering, <laughs> I'm wondering if that's your your lasting memory. The beer chug on the first tee for sure, because <laughs> I had told you know after after my uh, opening round with Brooks, we won the first uh, the first match. Uh, I was told by Captain Stricker I wasn't going out in the afternoon. I said, "Well, can I go to the first tee?" and throw beers to the crowd um like they're they're going crazy like this would be a cool way to get them fired up and he was like he's like listen if you do it i'm not saying yes you know so it's not it's not going to be me saying you could do it and i was like all right that was kind of a yes that was kind of a no i don't really know and then finally i was just like jt was sitting there in the locker room and i was like yo dude like let's fill up this bag with beers and let's go check them at the crowd and we went out there and obviously you know, things got a little out of hand and, you know, a beer landed on the floor and JT was like looking at me and I was looking at him and I was like, yeah, let's do it. You know, <laughs> and, um, you know, it looked like he probably hadn't shotgunned the beer in 10 years, but I don't think he know, shotgunned just, it. I think he just tried to straight chug it. I don't think that. Yeah. Really I don't know what he did. My beer, camp. my beer was gone, but you know, I went to Florida state and, you know, we shotgun a few beers in college. So I'm not saying that I'm good at shotgunning beers, but I'm better than, than him at it. <laughs> Yeah, you could have club, you could have club twirled that one. You had that one. Mm-hmm. Uh, you you had that one down, and, and you were strutting off. The other memory I have from that, uh, especially, is when you and Brooks see almost got in a fight with a rules official uh, on the fifteenth hole in your guys' match. Uh, take us to that spot because I remember you guys uh, getting getting into it with a rules official over uh, some yeah. relief that wasn't given. Well, oh, I sliced one about fifty yards right of the fairway into like a hole. I never seen a, a hole like this in my life, and. I would say, like, if I had to put the odds at it, I would say nine out of 10 times in a PGA Tour event, you would get a free drop. Like, just being honest, I really believe that nine out of 10 times a rules official would have given you a drop. For, like, you know, they give you, like, you get these animal holes or whatever, and, like, they just give you a drop. And, uh, I mean, obviously, he wasn't getting a drop, and he was, 
you know, adamantly wanting one. And I mean, I was wanting one too, but you know, things get a little chippy in Ryder cups, but in the end, you just, you just accept whatever the ruling is and you just play on. And, um, you know, we, I think in that match, we had a, a big early lead and we kind of faltered in the middle of the round and we went from like a couple up early to a couple down. And so it was a big momentum change, uh, with a couple holes to go. And, you know, we didn't play our best, but you know, we, we have the the trophy at the end of the, at the end of the week. So it didn't really matter. Well, you seem like a hyper competitive dude. I can't imagine just how much you, you, you got to play a 2017 president's cup, 2021 Ryder cup, both on home soil like that. Mm -hmm. That has to just be your type of environment. That has to just be like wh what gets your juices flowing. Yeah. And I think, I just think the guys that I've played on both of those teams with were like, you know, my kind of people. And um, I think that's what really, you know, creates a great environment for success is when you have, you know, 10 or 11, 12 guys on a team that really like are competitive. Well, everyone's competitive, but really like get along together and have that same kind of, you know, feed off that kind of energy. And um, I think a lot of those guys were around the same age as me for the most part, JT, Jordan, uh, Max, all those guys were right around, you know, my age. So, you know, we grew up playing together. We're feisty and, I think uh, when you get those kind of guys together, you know, usually it's a good recipe for success. I'm uh, remembering back to 2017 Saturday night, you guys are up by a gajillion points uh, over the international team. You get interviewed going into, to, into the final round. Do you remember what exactly what your quote was? Did you get any, uh, any back, uh, backlash from that after that happened? Yeah, I think I, I think I said something along the lines of uh, he asked me like, you know, what do you like? how's it going to go tomorrow? And I said, well, I, you know, I hope we beat them worse tomorrow than we beat them today or something. And like Twitter, I think at the time went crazy. They're like, Oh my God, you're so you know disrespectful. Like this is a team competition. And I was like, dude, if you're not thinking that, then you should go get another job. Cause every single guy on this team is thinking the exact same thing. And uh, you know, I get it. Like people are kind of soft these days. I feel like they're just hypersensitive and like, I don't know, but <laughs> why, a, why, what team environment would you not want to get up there and just crush, crush them every single time and like try to set a record and beat them by more points than anyone's ever beaten them. And I feel lucky because the two team events I've ever played in, like we, I think we set records in both of them. The exact quote. I mean, our goal from the uh, minute we got here was to crush them as bad as we can. I hope that we close them out today and we go out there and beat them even go out there tomorrow and beat them even worse. That's great. You're exactly right. Like it's come on. It's if if we can't say something like that, then what's the point of having these competitions? Like hundred uh, percent. But no, that was. Did you guys go a little too hard? If I remember right, on Saturday night, a uh, little celebration before uh, Sunday singles at the, at the 2017 Presidents Cup. Well, no, our our goal was to close them out on Saturday, and I remember Charlie Hoffman halved or lost his match on Saturday to keep it going into Sunday. And every time I see Charlie often, I remind him about that match that he didn't win. And, uh, and every time he sees me, he just laughs about it. But, you know, I don't, I mean, I just think those team matches are about, you know, the camaraderie of the, of, of the group of people you're with. And, you know, every single guy on that team is just as competitive as I am. So it's a great, it's a great thing to be a part of. It's funny to look back at that. I was watching a couple of highlights today and just the, the tight, like Tiger and Phil in the, in the team room of that, right. As Tiger, oh being my God. Kept, how much has changed since then? But God, what was that? I am so like, I, I feel so lucky that I was able to be like a part of a team environment with like, who have like arguably the greatest golfers of our, of all time. And like Tiger was a, was a vice captain and like he was in his prime, like, not prime, but he was like healthy and he was like super involved and, and like Phil was playing and it was just so cool to be around those guys and, and to just hear them talk and to share stories and to just, just be around that kind of greatness. Cause was it like a little bit of eggshells in terms of, cause if I remember right, I remember uh, Phil made a putt or something on one of the holes and tiger like did a big gesture. And I remember us in the media were kind of like, Whoa, like tiger, like tiger rooting on Phil. Mm -hmm. That that's not how their careers have gone. What was it kind of like in that team room? Were you guys kind of feeling out what their relationship was like at that point? You know, they're actually like, they're totally fine together. I, I don't know if like the media makes it out to be something other than it is, but you know, like they are, they're totally fine. And like, we played ping pong one day and uh, it was just so funny because, you know, Phil, I feel like, 
he thinks he's the best at everything he does. And like, he'll, we played ping pong and he was talking about how he's like taken like hours and hours of lessons. And like, you know, he's this like world-class ping pong player and he's, you know, he's the best one there. And like Tiger's never played really. I mean, he's played, but he's not really played. And they were going at it one-on-one and it was just funny to watch these guys. Like they're both terrible at ping pong, but they're ultra competitive. And just to watch them be bad at something and still want to win so badly. I just was laughing the whole time. Do you have, I hate what I ever asked this question, but do you have like a go-to Phil Mickelson story? I feel like everyone's got one and I, I could, I can, I could listen to all of them. I have I have a lot of Phil Mickelson stories. I actually was I wouldn't say I was close with him, but you know I enjoyed you know hanging out with him and playing a couple practice rounds with him. But the first year or maybe my second year on tour, I had a three shot lead at uh, Memphis, which was the first golf tournament I ever won. And I think he was like in second place trying to win the golf tournament. And uh, we there was a, like a two hour rain delay in the final round. And I used to I used to mess with him and I used to call him Philip all the time. And uh, he came at me and he was like, well, you can't call me Philip anymore until you win. He's like, I'm Phil until you win. And then I won that golf tournament for the rest of the year. I just kept calling him Philip everywhere. So I don't know. He's a good dude. I, I think, you know, there's a lot that's gone on in the golf world. But, you know, I respect everything he's done for the game of golf. And he's been a great ambassador. And those guys are going to – I mean, they're just the reason why people love watching the game. You know, like you – regardless of how you feel about him – you would turn on the TV to watch Phil Mickelson compete. And like, I was it last year. He finished second in the masters and he's, he's, what is he? 50 years old, 51 years old. He won a major, he won a major at what? 50 years old. He like that's 51 when just, he won at Kiowa and he's 54 now or 53 now. It's yeah. insane. I mean, to win the PGA championship at 51 years old is just, it's insane. And it's, it was so good for the game of golf. And like, I remember watching the 18th hole, the crowds coming down the fairway, I was like, this is what we need in this game right now. And it sucks to see like how far we've come from that moment to where we are now, you know? That's exactly right. I mean, he's just been an incredible entertainer for all of us for so long. And uh and yeah, man, it's just crazy to look back at all the footage from all that stuff and just just think about how much all yeah. has changed since then. But Growing up, you you so if for people that aren't familiar, uh, you don't we don't have to do your whole background story, but you grew up in South Florida, um, Saint Jupiter area. I mean, the 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 names of the clubs and and whatnot from the stories of your of your childhood sound quite familiar to to where you currently live. But uh, the Die Preserve, tell us about there working there and uh, kind of how you found yourself in in some in some money games there. Yeah, I, I grew up in Miami, and uh, my dad worked for the USTA. And uh, their offices moved from Miami to Boca. So we moved from Miami to Jupiter. So it was a little bit of an easier drive. And uh, my dad reached out to uh, one of his old uh, kind of guys, Yvonne Lendl. And Lendl set me up with one of his buddies, Matt Doyle, who was the uh, who was one of the teaching pros at the Die Preserve and took a lesson from Matt. And he said, hey, if you ever want to come out here and play, like, we'll set you up. We'll, we'll set you up with a job. You can caddy. You can work the range. And I was like, my eyes lit up 15 years, 14, 15 years old. I was like, this is incredible. And I spent every single day there from like 2000. I mean, I don't know how old I was, 14 or 15, from sun up to sundown, picking the range, playing golf, hanging out with the guys. Um, it was a, it was an amazing time. And I, and there was a bunch of pros that were playing out there. Steve Marino, Jesper Parnovic, you know, a ton of tour guys. And I think they – uh they had a little liking for me, you know, they saw that I was kind of a competitive guy. I didn't really take a lot of shit for a 14 year old. And, you know, Steve really brought me in, which is so incredible of him. You know, he was a top 30 player in the world at the time. And, you know, he would come out there and play golf with me. And so I really, from an early age, I got to see some of the best players in the world and got to play against them. And I remember when I went to college, you know, my first college golf tournament, I was like, man, these guys, are not that good you know they're good but they're not that good when you're used to playing with these you know pj tour players and so it kind of just gave me a different outlook on like what it takes to get good and 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 what to expect and and from there i just i think uh, i owe i owe a lot to steve because he's really he's been there for me for a long time and he's uh he's just a great dude and not a lot of guys i feel like would take a 14 year old under their wing and spend time with them and play golf with them so i'm thankful for that for sure what is it about play? Like at that age, playing with good players. What what do you take away? Do you remember specifically what you remember walking away uh, thinking about, and and how did that help you improve? Well, first off, I just remember watching him practice. I remember seeing the stuff that he did, 
just watching someone of that level and, and being able to pick their brains on like what they're doing and what they're thinking about that just gets you such a step ahead when you're not able to do that at, you know, even a later stage in your career, like some of these guys that are coming out in college, like they've never played against a PJ tour player. I mean, these guys are better now coming out of college than, than we were when I came out, but you just have a, an earlier sight at what your competition is going to look like and, and what to expect. And you're not as phased when you see what you're playing up against. Tell, tell me about playing, uh, playing money games with, uh, with Steve Marino when you're 14, 15 years old or whatever it was. Well, he, uh, he tells a lot of stories that are different from my recollection. You know, I think he was on Colt Nose podcast telling a story about, you know, taking my iPad, which was, or iPod, which was true. It was just my recollection of it was different than his recollection of it. But, you know, I used to do like nine hole putting contests with him on the putting green for like 500 bucks. And I had like $12 in my pocket. And my recollection is that I beat him in a putting contest for $500 and he would not pay me. And he made me go out and play holes with him. And, and like by the seventh hole, he was up like $500. And, uh, but he's, he's been there. He's been there for me for so long. And again, he was that first guy that really took me under his wing. And, um, but it's yeah, those a good are lesson good to learn. Days. Even it's worth yeah. the price of an iPod or whatever. I, did he <laughs> it hold on to it for a couple the of years? Crazy, the, the crazy thing was is that he actually held on to the, to the iPod for like two and a half years, like maybe longer, like three and a half years. He had the iPod sitting on his dresser in his nightstand in his house. And finally, I think I made it to the corn Ferry tour and made my first check. And I like, gave him a gave him like a thousand bucks cash and i was like dude stop telling that story to people because he was going around telling it to everybody he could tell it to so he's a funny dude though that's great <laughs> that's great there's something there is something about uh just for me like moving to florida and just getting to tee it up with many tour guys every now and then is just a total total game changer like you just like yeah. your mindset totally changes and just watching good shots on repeat becomes mm -hmm. i that's why i don't i couldn't tell if you know if, if your experience was you know, stuff that you specific stuff you took away or just like, hey, when there's a standard of golf right next to you happening, you just naturally raise like your 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 body wants to raise to that whatever that level is. Like that's the importance yeah. of competition. No, I think that's the that's the best way to put it is just when you're around it and you see it, then you just raise your level to it. So what, how do explain to us kind of how the, uh, the, the clubs of, of jupe life work, right? There's bears club, there's medalists. You hear about all these clubs, like who, how do you know, do clubs like recruit pros to come play in it? How do guys end up being members at one or two or three courses? What, what's the kind of the, how do the, is it a political situation? Explain to us how the, how all that situation works down there. Well, I, I was lucky because, you know, I've been here for a long time. I've lived here since, you know, forever. And, um, I think it was, less challenging to get into some of these upper echelon clubs at the time because you know maybe bears club would have had you know 15 pros playing there at the time and now they have 30 right and like you can't have there's only a limited number of spots to get into the club you can't have you know 60 pros playing in there so it's 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 much more difficult now to get in but you know i had a great relationship with uh with mr nicholas and called him up on the phone and kind of explained my situation to him and he let me in and you know, so I had the Die Preserve and I had the Bears Club and I feel like I had the best of both worlds. I had, you know, two kind of completely separate golf courses. And, um, you know, one was a one was really challenging around the greens, the Bears Club and, and the die was always really tough off the tee. So I could really practice two different sides of my games, getting ready for golf tournaments. But, yeah, I mean, there's the amount of golf courses and the amount of That's good sick. golf courses in uh, in in this kind of like 60 mile radius of like you know, Boca to, you know, Hope Sound is just astounding. And like, I think, you know, there's four or five new golf courses, the Apogee um, in Hope Sound, and you've got, you know, Grove, uh, you got Michael Jordan's golf course, and you got the new Discovery golf course. And it's just, you got Panther National. It's like, I don't know where these golf courses are popping up and how they're popping up so quickly, but it's really kind of becoming like the Mecca of golf, this kind of South Florida region. But yeah, it's competitive now to get into these courses as a pro because there's just so many guys down here and there's so limited amount of spots to get in that you really have to, you know, build a relationship with, you know, the people that make the decisions and, and hopefully get lucky enough to join them. How, how do how do the games get arranged? Like, is there one massive text chain for like all the Bears Club tour pros? Do you have like little clicks that they go off in certain? How do you get how do you find a foursome and how competitive are the games? 
I think at this point, like I've been down here for so long and I've been a bear, I've been at the bears club in the die preserve for so long. You, you literally show up to the bears club range and there's, you know, 12 touring pros practicing at a time, 15 guys practicing. And you know, the guys that are more into the practice and you go know the guys that are more into the playing. And so I, I tend to gravitate to the guys that like to play more like, you know, Alex Noren, he's a practicer and, uh, you know, Luke Donald is a player or Camillo is a player or Keegan's a player. So you kind of, find the guys that like to, to play more and you find the guys that like to practice more and you just figure out which, which guys are ready to go. And I mean, any, at any given day, like I said, you could, you could see 15 guys on the range getting ready to, you know, to go to a tournament and it's, everyone wants to stay competitive. So everyone wants to play golf and it's, it's really actually it's super easy. Well, the last topic I wanted to talk to you about was, uh, was confidence. And I might be asking this selfishly as someone who just, uh, royally shat the bed in a tournament recently, but <laughs> mental mental preparation is, is is valuable, and I I want to know kind of what your journey has been like on that, right? I mean, everybody goes through ups and downs when it comes to confidence, but kind of what you fall back on uh, from a mental standpoint. It's not as simple as hey, just go have a good attitude out there and you're going to play great. I'm sure there's a ton you've learned and how to channel confidence into success on the golf course. I'm wondering uh, what kind of lessons you could teach on that front. Well, I think that the most important thing with confidence comes down to, to practice, right? Like the more you practice, the better you feel about your game, the better um, understanding you have of what shots going to come out. So for me, that's what practice all is all about. It's about building confidence and what you're going to go do out on the course. But I think the realization that everyone's going to hit bad shots, you know, it's just a part of the game is really kind of something that like relaxes me because you're not going to go out and and play 18 holes and hit, you know, 18 perfect shots off the tee and 18 perfect putts and 18 perfect chips or whatever. It's so it's really just about getting over the ball and just doing the best that you can do at that time and accepting the result. And I feel like the confidence comes from being okay with hitting, you know, shots that aren't perfect. And really enough for me, I've played 25 years of golf and I've seen everything you can see on a golf course. Nothing really shocks me. It just makes it much easier. Hmm. I've heard you also talk about breathing, like the importance of breathing. Whenever I've tried this, I just I find myself getting more nervous, like the more deep breaths I try to take. But is there a science to kind of breathing and managing nerves and, and, and how, how that affects your golf game? Yeah, number one thing that I always do on the golf course is breathe. Um, I always try to make a big exhale right before I take the club away or, you know, right before I take the putter back. And um, it's something that I've, that I've worked on since I was like 14 or 15 years old. And I find in the biggest moments in the most important, the most pressure filled moments, the only thing I'm ever thinking about is my breathing. It never is about, am, am I going to make this putt? Am I going to hit the green? Am I going to hit it in the fairway? It's always focused on the breath and it's always focused on, you know, the exhale right before I take the club away. And, and then it kind of frees you up. It kind of takes away any thought of anything else going in your mind. It's it's like a little mini version of meditation. But I'm sure, you know, m my method may be simple compared to, you know, what some of these other guys do. But I think if you looked at the top 20 players in the world, they would all have some sort of breathing technique that they're using before they're hitting a golf shot. Gosh, I haven't, I haven't thought of it that way in Long, long time. I'm gonna take that take that with me. What's uh for for the listeners? What's what's your plan kind of for the rest of the year? Are you playing everything that you're in? What can people expect to see you in? And and kind of what's the rest of your year look like? Yeah, I think it's gonna be kind of an evolving schedule as the year goes on. Um, just based on how I play. Um, you know, I know I'm gonna play this week at the Cognizant, which is you know my home event, and um, I think I'll add events here and there, but just not knowing exactly what tournaments I'll be in in terms of the elevated events, you know, based on my play, it's kind of just going to have to evolve as, as the year goes on, but just lucky and, and, and grateful that I'm healthy and, and, and can play in as many golf tour tournaments as I want to play in. Well, we look forward to watching it, man. We appreciate your time uh, today and we're glad to have you back and, and healthy and playing some golf. And uh, we look forward to seeing you down the road. Appreciate your All time. Right, thanks, Chris. Appreciate Thank it. Cheers.